Welcome back to Between the Levees. Please stick around at the end of this episode for some samples of music written by Chad Jenkins. The song is called Down River. It is available on YouTube. The link will be in the description below. It will be released on Spotify very soon and wherever else uh, his music is available. Thank you very much. I am joined today by Mr. David Ryan, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Associated Terminals. This will be my first foray into the world of stevedoring on the show. Mr. Ryan, thank you very much for joining me. Tim, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Honored that you asked me to, to take part in this. I've, I've seen a couple of the episodes or a number of the episodes, actually, and uh, I think it's a very interesting piece that you're doing here. So I'm I'm happy to be a part of it. Thanks again. Well, if you've seen these before, you know how they begin. So where were you born? So, Tim, I was actually born in New Orleans, uh, only 10 blocks or so away from the, the Mississippi River, which is interesting uh, that, I, you know, I ended up back with my career so closely tied to to, to that to that very river. Um, so uh, I was born in New Orleans and uh, we... Uh, at the time, we, we lived right off of Orange Street, which is in, in what they referred to as the, the warehouse district, which I can assure you at the time was not the coolest area that it is. Uh, and then um, we made a, a couple moves, uh, one to Luling, one to Detrahan, and before settling uh, in the North Shore, right about my teenage years. So, and... Uh, and then from there went to went went to went to school out there and uh, and uh, high school out in out at Covington and um, uh, where and that whole area was where the general uh, majority of my misspent youth was. Well, what did your parents do for a living? So um, my, uh, my 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 father was uh, he he initially uh, from as far back as he's gone with his history, but me uh, was just uh, in the military. He was in the Air Force. Uh, and then um, well, I will also mention his stint in uh, uh, at LSU. He's, he's quite proud of that because he, uh, you know, was a, uh, attending LSU uh, in 1958 when they won their first uh, national championship there. So he will, he will certainly, he would certainly tell you about that. But uh, at any rate, uh, he, was, he was, he was in the air force and then uh, he got out of the air force and at some point beyond that, he went to work for a company uh, that's uh, tied to the, the river is uh, a, a group called international Medex tank terminals. And uh, he, um, he worked, uh, with that company uh, un until he retired uh, around 2006, 2007. Uh, he, uh, interestingly enough, um, that same company, uh, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but I, I ended up working for uh, as well as did uh, a couple of my brothers at, at different points of their lives. Uh, and um, my, my mother, she, um, she, uh, when I was very, very young, worked for Ma Bell. She worked for the phone company and uh, was a was actually a switchboard operator uh, before taking on the role, for the most part, a full-time mother for, for quite some time. Uh, once we moved out to the Covington area, though, our, our family bought a, a small uh, store out there, sort of like a convenience store. And uh, she she ran that for some time as well. So, um, but uh, uh, you know, back to my father, he he retired uh, around 2006 2007 time frame. Uh, at, at which time he uh, stayed retired for a total of about three months, uh, and uh, he went back to work. Uh, and uh, is day. Uh, and just turned 88 in January. So he, um, he had a good portion of you know, his life, you know, really uh, being a, uh, uh, you know, some, someone who works a lot. And, and so he, he didn't have a whole lot of hobbies outside of work. And so it just made sense for him just to continue, continue working and do what he liked to do rather than uh, what he would consider wasting time or 
fishing or playing golf or something uh, to that effect, you know, uh, something that, uh, you know, the rest of us long to do when we retire. Um, but it was, I think it was that, that, that same work ethic that he showed uh, throughout my childhood on even to now uh, that, uh, uh, that he sort of instilled in myself and, you know, my, my brothers and, and even my sisters. And because um, I can remember uh, once we had moved out of New Orleans and made those couple stops and ended up landing on the North Shore there, that um, I, I don't ever remember not having multiple jobs. So once we, we at, at the time, and I, I don't know how familiar you are with, with the Covington area, but it, it was very rural then. It's, it's grown up a lot now and it's become a nice, nice town and nice area. And, and, and it was nice then, but it was very, very rural. And so, you know, I spent my time uh, mowing grass and mowing our neighbor's grass. And then I also spent time with, you know, uh, one of my neighbors had had a farm uh, and ran a produce station. And so I would go help him farm. And then I would go on the weekends and help him run his produce station. And in addition to his produce uh, uh, store there, he had a, a snowball stand, which I, I ran that for him as well. Uh, and then I, I, I had another uh, neighbor who was a plumber. Whenever he needed a hand, uh, you know, he would give me a call and I'd go give him a hand and, uh, you know, learned, learned how to do some plumbing alongside of him. And, uh, uh, and, and, and really that just sort of was just who I was um, uh, all the way until now, you know, just somebody who, who constantly, it, and it's more than just work ethic. It's, it's that thirst for knowledge of different things to be involved, you know, and, um, and so that, that fared well for me, uh, when I was, uh, again, as I was coming up in, in, in school, uh, I was involved in all sorts of, uh, a lot of sports. Uh, I mean, I, again, moving out to the Covington area where I went to, uh, um, primary school there, uh, it was very small. And so there weren't a lot of kids there. And so, uh, our sports team were sports teams were, were lacking for, um, a number of folks that were interested in playing. And so therefore, uh, you know, if you played anything, coach would consistently be on you. Hey, you know, I played football, you know, and I played baseball. So coach is like, um, Hey, we need folks on the volleyball team. You want to play? And so, yeah, I'd play, or, you know, we, we need folks to, fill out, uh, have enough folks to run a track meet. Are you interested in running track? And so, so our track, so I did, did all the things, uh, but um, so, you know, I certainly kept myself busy uh, and, um, but it was, it, it, it was, it was a very interesting time. It was a very fun time, um, but it was, it was chock-a-block full the whole time for sure. So. Busy sounds the, like a, uh, bit, a bit of an understatement for you. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. well, let me back up. Uh, what did your father do in the Air Force? So uh, he, you know, quite frankly, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I, I know that uh, uh, I think most of his stuff was office related. He wasn't he didn't see any any action anywhere. He wasn't he certainly wasn't a pilot. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit remiss in, in, in knowing that. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Uh, there was a bit of an audio glitch when you said it, but what was the name of the company he joined that was, uh, attached to the river? Sure. It's called International Matex Tank Terminals, uh, also known as IMTT among folks who work on, sure. the, on the river. And what did he uh, do for them? So he, he started out being an operations manager. Uh, ultimately, uh, they, uh, utilized him in, in several different uh, positions, but um, uh, he was moved to uh, Virginia. As IMTT was growing as, as a company, they were buying different terminals uh, and becoming a, an international, uh, a national and international presence. When they, they, had, they had teamed up with the Van Ameren folks um, and, and, and uh, bought some 
international terminals, but here in the U.S., they were uh, acquiring uh, U.S. terminals um, as well. And as part of that, um, the Coleman family, who were the primary owners of IMT, they, when they, they teamed up with the Van Amren uh, group, uh, the Coleman family would have um, uh, uh, operating jurisdictions over the, the domestic terminals and the Van Amrens over the over the, the international terminals. And then at some point they separated. But uh, as part of that, uh, like I said, they were they acquired terminals around the United States and um, and they had acquired a couple of them in Virginia. And then they asked my father to run those facilities uh, in Virginia. And so the two terminals there, which were one was located in Chesapeake, Virginia, right there on the southern branch of the Elizabeth River. Uh, and one was in Richmond, right off of the James River. Uh, and so he um, he ran those two facilities there until his retirement. And, uh, uh, and then subsequently uh, after retirement uh, has gone on to work as consultant and, and, uh, and then other terminal operations. Well, back to you. I know you said uh, you played sports and stayed pretty busy with jobs, but were you drawn to anything academically? So not, not particularly, uh, I, I, you know, I, interestingly enough, you know, as I, as I finished high school, I was, I was, a, I was a decent student. Wasn't great. I was, uh, you know, I, uh, um, uh, I, uh, I, I spent a lot of time in, with my extracurricular activities. Uh, I was, you know, big into, you know, uh, again, sports and, and even music. Um, but, you know, I was, but I was a, a decent student and, you know, my, my teachers would point out that uh, they, they thought uh, the, you know, English and, and, and writing was, was sort of one of my strong points. And, uh, and so whenever somebody takes a shine to you, you, you kind of, you know, you, uh, particularly when you're young like that and in school, uh, uh, you, you sort of head wreck. Um, and so I, when I was in high school, uh, you know, I was to the point where um, they had, a, they had programs where you could finish your prerequisite courses in high school for the college that you were going to angle towards, which for me was LSU. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I started acquiring some, some credits, uh, uh, for LSU during my high school years, in addition to, uh, the, the high school classes that I was taking. The thing that sort of stopped that, because, because I'll tell you, ultimately, I never did finish, uh, LSU. The thing that sort of brought that to a halt was, um, the thing that brought, almost everything to a halt for me, which was all my sports and all that sort of stuff was girls, <laughs> right? So I ended up meeting uh, the person who would become my wife uh, during my senior year of high school. Uh, and once out of high school, I was married by that December. And so at the time I was, you know, again, contemplating, you know, either, you know, going on to college or even, military was something that was in my in my thought process uh my, you know uh, my father was military a brother was military when my my older sister was military and so that was something that was prevalent in my thoughts but then uh once i i met my wife that sort of uh, um those those thoughts sort of uh took a back seat to uh us at the time and so it was one of those things where uh interestingly enough uh we were high school sweethearts she went to mandeville high school i was at covington high school she changed high schools uh to uh, to be uh to over to covington high school and and and, uh, and then it went from there and so subsequently we've now been together this year will be 37 years so congratulations i won't well, tell you, you i won't tell you how old i am <laughs> well I've, I've seen some of these before i've got a, a pretty decent idea but you know what I, I get that a lot from folks when uh you know they they look at me and they say well man you don't look like you've been married 37 years and uh, you know 
my running joke is that, yeah, I did it when I was seven, you know, but, uh, it's, it, it certainly feels like that long ago, but, uh, but I get that quite a lot. So, but, uh, at any rate, what were you studying at LSU? So at, at that time I was just doing general studies, uh, to, to wipe out all the prerequisite courses. My goal was, was going to be business. Um, uh, you know, I, um, I, I guess, you know, that's, that's something that just sort of applies across the board. I, I tell you, Tim, it's, it's, it's really interesting to me, uh, you know, what I, what I came to learn was, um, and, and it's been reinforced over the course of my life is that while, um, uh, you know, furthering your education is always a good thing. It certainly is not the most important thing you know i think folks who you know have a, a quest for um knowledge you, you can feel that in a lot of ways and i and i've, I've come to learn that you know, experience is is really the greatest educator that there is you know because I, I you know I've, I've, I've subsequently done you know all, all the courses and all that sort of stuff, but never learned more than I did or than I have, I should say, uh, in, in, the, in the various uh, uh, positions that I've, I've served either at work or in uh, um, organizations related to work uh, um, and, and, and what have you. Did your wife attend LSU? She did not. She did not. Uh, she, um, she went on to become a mother, uh, uh, the, the following year and, uh, and she, she did, uh, spend some time in the medical field, about 20 years, um, uh, working as a medical assistant, uh, and then, uh, gave that up. Uh, oh, I guess probably maybe a dozen years or so ago, uh, and just as enjoying being, uh, the, the um like what she refers to as the ceo of casa de ryan without a doubt did uh did having a child prompt your departure from college it it uh it, it prompted my necessity to go uh to work uh and so i had taken a job uh with this uh, beef processing company and um where they would take uh these boneless sides of beef and they would, uh, they would process it into what ultimately were like hamburger patties for one of the, the major uh, fast food chains. And they would, they would, they would put out about, uh, about 300,000 pounds of beef per day. Uh, and, um, and so I worked for those guys and um, uh, again, another great learning experience, something I, I totally had no idea about, uh, and, and, and at that point I was, uh, 18 years old, uh, and I, um, I, I became what was their, their youngest, uh, supervisor, uh, in the history of the company. And, uh, and I worked there for, uh, several years and, uh, was involved in a workplace accident where, uh, I got my hands caught in uh, one of my hands caught in a beef processing machine uh, to which I had to have multiple surgeries to repair. Uh, and then uh, from I had spent some time out of work and then I had gotten a call from my father who said, hey, I've got an opportunity here if you're interested in it. And it was uh, with the IMTT group. Um, and it was uh, in their, uh, it was as their assistant traffic manager. So in their traffic and logistics group. Uh, and uh, so I took, I took that job. I saw it as an uh, interesting uh, opportunity. Uh, and, and boy, was it. Uh, I went there and, excuse me. I, I went, I, I moved to Virginia and uh, started working for IMTT. And uh, that, that job itself, the traffic and logistics, was such an interesting job. It, you know, it puts you, as you probably well know, you become the liaison between your operations group and the customer itself. And so you get to see both ends of the spectrum there. And um, it really 
sort of is a an eye opening job because you have to, and it is absolutely one of the most difficult jobs because you have to, you know, the old saying is you can't please two masters. Well, you have multiple masters to please when you're in traffic and logistics, and uh, and so it teaches you to to um, to operate in a, in a in a constantly changing field with multiple changing priorities. Uh, and, um, and, it, and it really was a, 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 a great learning experience. And then uh, also it, it, it put me in connection and, and started to develop my, my affinity for um, the, the maritime field uh, and, and connective uh, facilities, you know. Um, and I, I, I worked for uh, IMTT for close to 18 years. And, but I held multiple positions with those guys. Um, uh, interestingly enough, when I uh, started working in the logistics and uh, traffic group there, you have to do a lot. I told you before, I had a great amount of, uh, or some amount of interest in, in, in writing. And, um, uh, and so I, uh, I found that I could exercise that, that muscle, if you will, uh, in that in that job because you're constantly writing orders and 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 then corresponding with uh, customers and vessels and agents and certain groups and and what have you uh, and then um, I, I think the company started to notice that I that I had some sort of uh, I don't want to use the word gift there but I was somebody who could uh, you know write relatively well. Uh, and so they they picked up on that and said, hey, here's a way we can get more out of this guy uh, without probably having to pay him anymore. And um, and and uh, um, at the time, I go back to talking about how, you know, IMT was buying different terminals around the United States, uh, sort of ad hoc. Uh, everybody had had different policies and programs uh, as, as part of their terminals. And then when the group had gotten large enough, they said, you know what, we need more of a, a corporate structure or more of a corporate background, backbone, I should say, uh, to, to run all these facilities. And so uh, at, at that point, I, um, I worked myself into a, uh, a position writing um, uh, policies and procedures related to uh, safety. And, uh, and at that time, um, you know, um, that's that's it was not long after the open 90 act came out so it required that everybody have frp uh, facility response plans and spill response plans and um and, and that sort of stuff and so so i i took on that as well uh and uh, and then as part of that uh you know i the constant learning i, I went and earned my uh uh my my um my uh, CSP, which is a certified safety professional uh, from the National Association of Safety Professionals. Uh, but then I also, um, again, help write all of our, our, our environmental plans and programs. And then um, uh, I had also um, uh, had taken um, uh, uh, incident commander training classes and became an incident commander of the PIC for the facility. Uh, and um, uh, for that, for anybody that doesn't know what that does, is that it trains you how to uh, become somebody who can command and 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 direct uh, folks and operations during major uh, uh, happenings like oil spills or various hazmat spills or or, or something of that nature. Really, any. <clears throat> incident but in our particular case it was based on hazardous materials and uh and so that that was uh that was again interesting to me uh it sort of broadened my horizon and you know now I went from a guy who was writing policies and procedures to somebody who uh had had this uh qualified individual status uh incident commander status um and that that really sort of put me in touch with a lot of different groups as well um, uh, and then, you know, next for me on the board for those guys was, it was also right about the time where 
uh, the ISO programs started becoming a really important thing to, to facilities. And uh, ISO, International Standards Organization, uh, for folks who don't know what that is, it's, it's really something akin to, let's just say, a college degree in a specific area for a company, right? So if someone from, uh, let's say, um, Europe wants to store uh, oil or something in the United States or, you know, move their commodities into the United States, they, unless your name is Exxon or Shell or something like that, uh, they don't really know who you are. So it's a certificate that says, hey, we have a system of good management practices uh, that you can rely on us and trust on us to handle your material uh, with the best management practices in mind. And so I, 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 I help co uh, had that team for the Virginia facilities uh, as well. And so uh, yet more opportunity to, uh, to, to put my writing skills to the test. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, meanwhile, while that was going on, <clears throat> uh, um, the, it wasn't too terribly long into that. I started work for IMTT in 92. And then, of course, in 2001, there was the whole 9 11 um, catastrophe, uh, terror attack. And, um, and then shortly thereafter became the, uh, the initiative for the MARSEC directives to come out for, for, for that required facilities to have uh, security plans. Again, I'm a guy that already writes policies and procedures. And so who do they turn to? They're like, hey, write us a procedure, you know, uh, and, and come up with a plan. Uh, so which which I did. Uh, my plan was one of the first in the nation to be approved uh, by the Coast Guard, uh, which was, uh, again, something that uh, I was I was I was pretty proud. Um, then also along that time was really a, a time that sparked my interest to start to take all these things now that I had learned, uh, because everybody at that point was wanting to do something, right? Uh, and, you know, folks, it caused some folks to, after 9-11 to want to join the military or to, uh, or to just do whatever you could. And for me, with the skill set that I had developed over the years with the, the QI uh, accreditation, incident commander, uh, and, uh, you know, training, uh, it, it was an opportunity for me on a personal level to take uh, some of those skills and actually bring it into my community. Uh, you know, I had some friends who were uh, firefighters or EMS type folks. And so I went and met with the, um, the head of the local fire department and said, <clears throat> hey, maybe between us, you know, uh, all of us, uh, um, we could create a, uh, a community emergency response team. Uh, folks didn't know, clearly none of us could know at the time whether uh, these uh, terrorist hits were going to be ongoing, if they were going to be, uh, you know, spread out all over the U.S., what towns could they happen in? And so we said, what can we do in our town? Um, and so, uh, so we started up a team uh, and uh, relayed some of our collective skills to to these folks that would help, that could help assist either fire department or EMS or even the military in, in case something like that happened in our town. And so gave, gave training to folks to uh, teach them to uh, triage uh, folks, uh, at least initial triage for folks that could be injured. And, uh, and, and then, you know, just sort of help, uh, you know, train these, uh, develop a group that could assist in, in any way, our, uh, um, you know, our municipal uh, 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 folks that were, that would be handling uh, the actual uh, situation itself. And so it, it was a way I could, you know, turn my, uh, some of this professional training uh, into something that I could help uh, in, in the local community. Um, so, um, you know, that, uh, again, that whole, 
you know, those years with IMTT were, you know, very formative for me and very, very good. Um, uh, like I said, it, it, it helped me develop a, um, a penchant though for, you know, being um, involved with international shipping and the maritime groups and, and what have you. Uh, you realize that there's a bigger picture uh, going on uh, uh, as opposed to some of the stuff that I did earlier in my career uh, in that the, the stuff that we were handling at the time, uh, you know, was came came from and went to all corners of the world. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I did that for a, a good amount of time. Uh, and then, you know, I, I decided that, um, uh, you know, uh, I was handling all these different programs and, 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 and subsequently, the, the, the guy who uh, was my boss, uh, 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 who was the terminal manager at the time, uh, he, had, he went on to take another job. And so I, I picked up interim uh, 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 responsibility to, to run those facilities. And so, um, so for a guy that was doing all the jobs that I had on, all the hats that I had on, uh, it, it doesn't take long for you to um, to burn out, you know, and so I, I felt like I was getting to to that point. I uh, and so I I'd, I'd gotten to the point where I was, you know, telling different folks like, hey, I'm I'm you know I'm in the market for maybe a different different opportunity, and uh, and so subsequently I have you know my brother lives down in Louisiana and from the time he was young uh you know just you know 18 or so he he had joined the marines and and he had taken off and you know and I had gone my way with my life and work and we had never had a chance to spend any time together and uh so once he uh uh you know had had finished his stint in the in the marines there uh you know he had sort of always been sort of goading me saying, Hey man, you know, wouldn't it be cool if, if we could live near each other and, you know, our families could, could, could be close by. And of course I said, yes, you know, and so once he found out I was in the mood for a career change, uh, he says at the time he was working for a group, um, which is named St. James Stevedore. Uh, and, um, and the two guys that own that, uh, Paul Morton and John Crane, and uh, he reached out to me and said, hey, man, they've, they've, they've really got a neat operation going on here. And he says, you know, more than more than a stevedoring company, he said, this is this is really a technology company. And so I just kind of just yesed him off at the time. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, quite frankly, when he when he first mentioned to me that uh, he was in the stevedoring group, I, I, I quite frankly had never heard the word before, <laughs> you know. And so I didn't even know what it meant, uh, uh, it, despite the fact that I worked uh, for IMTT and, you know, we had docs there, but we didn't particularly have, we didn't necessarily have stevedores, if you will, because uh, that was a liquid operation. But um, as fate would have it, uh, you know, I, I, I told him, yes, I would talk to him uh, just to satiate him. Um, uh and I don't know if I really had any intention on it at the time other than doing so solely for him. Um, but my, my aunt had passed away uh, down in Louisiana and I came down for her services. And I said, well, while I'm here, I'll, I'll talk to uh, uh, the St. James guys, John uh, Crane and Paul Morton. And in, in, in my discussion with those guys, um, uh, I, I really did like what they had going on. They told me about their operations. I could see uh, what they were doing as a company. I could, I could see the growth in the company. Uh, and, um, you know, and they were, they, they were telling me about the things that they had planned. And so I, I, I thought it really interesting. And, um, and, at the, and at the time when I wrapped up my discussion with them, uh, they, they told me, um, they said, look, we don't really have a, a position for you. They said, but we feel like you could be somebody that, you know, is, is quality person. And we hate to let somebody like that get away. And 
right, right at that point, uh, John Crane had looked over to Paul Morton and says, hey, I was thinking about expanding the sales uh, group because at the time it only consisted of John Crane. Uh, he said, you know, uh, he said, I feel like we could grow this business. He says it, it had just so happens as it is right now. Everything has the bottleneck through me. And so I feel like I could use, you know, somebody to to, to help us grow. And so then they looked at me at that time and, and this, this conversation was taking place between those two while I'm at the table. And uh, so then they looked at me and said, well, would you be interested in, in sales? And I, I just sort of giggled because I, I didn't have a very high opinion of sales folks at the time, not for any reason other than the only sales folks that I'd really ever been involved with were folks that were selling cars and nothing against them, but it just, you know, that high pressure type sales tactic just really would not be, would not fit in with who I am. And, uh, and so I just laughed at him. And I said, look, I spent a good portion of my career trying to avoid sales guys. So uh, besides I said, I, I don't have the gift of gab and I'm not even good at golf, you know? And so and they, they just sort of giggled and said, look, that's not the type of guys that we're looking for. You know, he said, we're looking for somebody that's going to, come in, learn the business, and then act like a consultant to our customers. And then it was really the next thing that they told me that sort of won me over. And they said, when you come in and learn our business, if you, they said, it's really about promoting business in the Mississippi River here. So if you feel like our potential customers would be more successful if they were to choose one of our competitors, by all means, we say send them there. We want those guys to be successful in order for us to be successful because eventually they will either come back, but at the very least, they'll continue to fuel commodities into the river. I thought that was very insightful. I thought it was an interesting way to think about uh, sales. It's certainly different than what I had ever thought. I had always seen it as a, uh, a very competitive cutthroat thing, uh, and they didn't see it that way at all. And so I uh, ultimately, I had um, I, I'd went back home after that meeting and I had had several other meetings with, uh, or, or at least a couple uh, that I had narrowed it down to, to very serious contenders. Uh, you know, one, the other two were more along, more along the lines that uh, the liquid end of things, the chemicals and petroleums that I had dealt with over the years. Uh, with uh, Colonial Pipeline and then another group called Texbar Energy. Uh, and um, uh, Texbar Energy, uh, you know, had won out of those two. And then it came down to Texbar Energy and, and, uh, and St. James. And, um, and so Texbar Energy uh, was soliciting me to ultimately um, be a regional manager for those guys. Um, and, but that, uh, job position was out of their home base, which was 50 miles above Green Bay, Wisconsin. So for me, a guy from New Orleans, that wasn't exactly appealing, even less so for my wife. She's like, if you go there, you'll go by yourself. And so, of course, Paul and John didn't know it, but that was the decision maker right there. It had nothing to do with contract negotiations or any of that sort of stuff. She, she pretty much told me we're heading south. And, uh, and quite frankly, it's, it's the best move I ever made um, uh, for a number of reasons. One of which is, you know, my, 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 uh, my folks, my, my, my wife's folks weren't, weren't getting any younger. Uh, and that put us much closer to them uh, down here. Uh, and then um, it, it turns out that um, uh, my stint with St. James would become a lot more than just in sales. Um, it, it wasn't too long into <clears throat> my tenure with those guys when it became, became evident that they were ultimately going to groom uh, myself, along with my brother, who was the, their director of operations, uh, and uh, another guy, um, uh, um, Jeff Morton, who was their director of finance, uh, to groom us to uh, eventually take over the business one day. Uh, as part of that, um, and I, you know, I, can, I can't ever have 
one job at a time. You know that uh, clearly as as evident from my childhood on up to volunteer times with the and developing community emergency response teams in Virginia and that sort of stuff. Um, Paul and John and Jerry and Jeff and I uh, had uh, created some companies outside of St. James Stevedoring. Um, and we had owned um, uh, tugboats and, or a tugboat. And, and we also developed, again, these guys thought more uh, about these companies being technology companies rather than certainly we're a service company, we're Stevedore, uh, but we're also tech, a technology company. And so the group of us uh, developed was this, this auger sampler, an automated auger sampler that was used out on the river for sampling barges. Uh, and I, I feel like it was ahead of its time. It, it gave uh, uh, groups the opportunity to take samples from barges without anybody ever getting on a barge. It could take full core samples uh, of a barge, whereas currently it's it's just hand samples, and, uh, you know, guys climbing on top of the pile with with shovels, and uh, this thing could auger down and and take full core samples. Uh, so it was just sort of a, ahead of its time. So it was sort of slow out of the gate, uh, and you know, in in retrospect, uh, you know, Paul and John uh, making us partners in those companies. Uh, wasn't totally altruistic uh, in that I think that they were, you know, readying us and familiarizing uh, us with the banks and the banks with us so that, that, you know, we would have the opportunity at some point to, to buy the company. Um, and so um, fast forward uh, to, you know, around 2013 or so, we started to have those discussions with John and Paul about buying the, buying the, the St. James Stevedoring company. Uh, and, um, and, and uh, you know, and I, I had told the story to a couple of folks before. Uh, so I know some folks have already heard this, but interestingly enough, uh, you know, we, uh, Paul and John, and ourselves, the directors, we 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 took a little um, <clears throat> a little um, team building trip, if you will, uh, to ultimately have this discussion. And we went and sat sat out at the the woodland plantation down there at the fishing lodge, uh, uh, as you will, uh, and started to discuss, you know, what John and Paul wanted for the company, uh, and uh, and ultimately. Uh, once we discovered what that was, we, we thought that that was a very doable thing. Um, I think to make a long story short, not belabor it, uh, what I think at the time they failed to realize the value of the company, uh, it's because it was so specialized and because it's a specialized field, uh, that, um, when we came back and we found out what the company was worth uh, as as a whole. We we saw that that was a lot bigger number than what the, the myself and the other two directors had intended, uh, and so uh, at that point, um, uh, that's when we entered into discussions with Associated Terminals and uh, yada yada yada. Uh, you know, fast forward. Uh, ultimately, uh, Associated Terminals offered them a, a price more than what we could put together. Uh, and then, so we were uh, bought out by those guys. Um, the, fun, the fun part is that, one of the fun parts is that those, those guys, and at, I'm saying those guys as associated, because I'm part of associated now, they could see the same things that we saw in that, you know, we weren't just a stevedore, right? So we're not guys that just move rocks for a living, even though I, I use that analogy a lot, you know, uh, um, in that the whole time we're, you know, um, providing customer service and, and, and um, hailing our customers and, and, and their, their products in, in, a, in, in a way that, uh, that is, you know, was, was 
fast, efficient, and safe. Uh, the whole time we are starting to uh, uh, do some interesting things that, that sort of changed the way stevedoring is done. Uh, one of those things was uh, we referred to them as got wall cranes, right? Uh, because that was the name brand of them when we first started doing this. It's now owned by Kona cranes, but for the purpose of this discussion, we'll just continue to call them got wall cranes. Well, got wall has been making cranes for over a hundred years. Um, and they, during that tenure had, had made some very technologically advanced high capacity cranes but they didn't have any that floated uh, you know, on the water. They had chassis mounted cranes or dock mounted cranes. And, um, and at the time, uh, the St. James folks uh, you know, said, hey, look, we need new cranes. Our, our older friction style cranes were uh, not very efficient. They were small. They, uh, you know, these, these things had you know, 12 and 15 yard buckets on them. And, um, uh, and if, you know, if you were to get through a shift with it without it breaking down, you were lucky, you know? So, um, you know, the, the owners of St. James at the time said, look, we either get new equipment or we get out of the business. Uh, and so they did a worldwide search, came across scout wall, uh, and then, um, said, Hey man, we like what you guys have going on. And got wall said, look, we've been wanting to do something on the river. We, uh, we've been looking for somebody crazy enough to try it with us. And of course they said, Hey, we're your guys. And so some of our team uh, went and met with their team and told them what we were looking for, gave them specs and that sort of stuff. And uh, they, 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 uh, so we helped co-conceive the world's first ever HPK series crane, the Harbor pontoon crane, which now is the standard by which stevedores are judged. Uh, the, um, uh, at that, at that point, uh, that came to the river, it was a game changer. Whereas before you had 12 and 15 yard buckets, you now had 64 yard buckets. These things are duty, duty cycling, you know, uh, with, you know, uh, you know, 50 tons of cargo. And, uh, and so it really sort of, uh, in, uh, in regard to, uh, stevedoring on the river. Um, uh, and another thing that it did was it created an arms race between, uh, you know, St. James and, and others uh, to, to see who could have the most of these things and, and, um, and, and, and eventually, you know, do the, do the fastest job because time is money. Meanwhile, while this new technology is in the river, uh, we realize that as opposed to the older diesel powered friction style cranes these were actually they had diesel motors on them but it was really only to run the generators uh which you know were running the electric motors on it right so it, it's very good for a number of ways it's it's a lot more environmentally friendly uh but it's also a lot safer crane it's a lot faster crane it's a lot stronger crane and and so but whenever you have a a a, a, a uh, a generator that, that that's running electric motors, it needs a PLC to tell that motor what to do. And in order to run a PLC, you've got to have a computer. And so for the first time ever, there was a computer out in the middle of the river reading and assisting in everything that these cranes are doing. And we said, hey, we can tap into that, you know, and we can determine a lot of things from that. One was our, our operational ability uh, you know, uh, we could we could read what individual operators were doing at any given time. We could see if there were safety issues, safety overloads on a crane. Did people need to be retrained? What have you? Uh, uh, we could uh, it that that we got that crane to be able to talk back to us from out in the river as well. We built our own systems that would go in and read everything that was in that that crane, it, it was telling itself and built a system that could take it and then send it back to us wirelessly over wireless transmission. Uh, and um, uh, uh, so we could see it in real time and things like maintenance, you know, this, this crane will tell uh, the maintenance, it will send maintenance team uh, an email saying, hey, my fuel filter is 85% clogged, you know. Uh, if 
if that gets to 90% and nobody's done anything about it, it'll send an email to the maintenance guy, but it'll also send an a email to his boss, you know? And so uh, it's, it, it's been a really interesting um, uh, transition to, to get to these cranes and, uh, and, and has been quite um, advantageous um, for us as a company uh, and subsequently associated terminals as a company, but also for our customers as well. So, um, and, you know, there are other uh, um, uh, technological advances that, that we're working on here. Um, we, you know, we realize, uh, you know, safety is a huge part of what we do. Of course, every, everybody, you know, says that and it's, and, it's, and rightly so. Um, but we, we put our money where our mouth is here uh, in a whole lot of R&D, right? Nobody likes to do the R&D part of anything. It's expensive, takes a long time to get to where you're going. But, you know, we've, we've made some headway and we, we're now to the point where we have, um, we have remote operated uh, material handlers in, in vessels out there. Uh, and so what that means is that you know, whenever you're biting material out of a ship or out of a barge, once you get down to what is what they call the tank top, which is the floor, uh, for folks who haven't don't understand our vernacular that that much, uh, once you get to the tank top, then you, you you put in a material handler and it and it it goes and it rounds up everything, and then you take your crane in there and you bite it out. Now that material handler that's down in in the vessel or in the barge itself no longer has a person who had to climb over the uh, down into the vessel or into the barge that actually is controlled from a person sitting in our office in the back in the back room back there so um, that's a, a huge leap forward in, in, in safety uh, and uh, and and efficiency because now you have you can run multiple machines with with one person um, and so but Things like that are repeated over and over in our business. Like we, we, you know, we have our IT group here is, you know, really is to because they've done so a job. They're they're only limited by our imagination. You know, uh, anything that we've ever asked from these guys, they delivered to us. You know, uh, and our IT team isn't your typical IT team, you, you know, a lot of folks, you know, at their office, their IT team is a guy who can, you know, come get your computer to boot when it can't boot or can get your Word document to format correctly. You know, our, 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 our IT team has, you know, is, is made up of electrical engineers. It's made up of ubiquitous engineering majors, it's robotics guys, things like that, you know. And so we have, we, we've had, you know, um, and, and they've done quite a great job for us. And they come into, quite frankly, an industry that had a lot of low hanging fruit. And so it's just been one project after another uh, for these guys, uh, just bringing us in, into the technological age and have done a great job. Well, I saw the uh, the video game chair there in your office uh, when you know, were in a testing phase. I think there was a dozer in the in the yard outside your building. How far does that thing reach? Like uh, meaning, can you control things in New Orleans from convent? That's correct. Yes. So we have an entire um, network background uh, backbone, rather that that goes all the way down. So really, it can reach. Um, yeah, we have um, berths that range all the way from Violet, which is down around mile marker fifty six or so. Uh, all the way up to mile marker 158, and we can control those from in, in any of those spots uh, with, with our our network backbone here. How so, was how was testing with those? How did that? Uh, how long did that take? Long, long, arduous, and expensive, right? And uh, it 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 really took some. Um, it took a, a good while. This has been in development for, you know, for the better part of 10 years. Uh, and it's only been within the last year or so uh, that, um, uh, you know, we've been able to put it actually inside of a barge or a ship and put it to work and now have gotten to the point where, uh, you know, we have multiple 
machines like this that are, you know, and eventually uh, I think I, I, I'm not hundred percent sure on the timeline, but I believe that by the end of the year, <clears throat> they want every one of our front end loaders to, to have that technology on it. And so, um, but it, 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 it took quite some time. Uh, it was a lot of <clears throat> time and effort. The, the problem primarily Tim was that you can, you can do a lot of interesting things, you know, wirelessly and remotely now, but the, the problem was, is that you had a, in this case, a front end loader, which was put inside of a metal box, i.e. the whole, the vessel hold out in the middle of the river, right? So you're dealing with interference, you know, I, in this day and age with, you know, cell phones and satellite phones and, and what have you, I still have a hard time with my cell phone when I'm sitting here in my office getting a reception, you know? Uh, so to, to put something behind several walls of steel and then put it out in the middle of the river, you know, and then you're on shore collecting this, 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 uh, this data wirelessly uh, and to not have it have a lag time that the human uh, brain can detect was it, you know, it was very complex. And, um, but our team did it. Uh, and they, they, they wrote all of the programming themselves. They, uh, you know, uh, the, the algorithms, you know, themselves. I mean, there, there, there's some, uh, was some initial user, you know, uh, readily available algorithms, but all of those, even, even when we could use some of those had to be tweaked for what we had going on. Um, so much, there's been so much um, improvement and development there and, and uh, to the point where uh, there are, international groups the largest ones in the world uh that that make some of these machines that are wowed by our capability and want it for their machines you know um i don't know if i'm allowed to say who that is um but i can tell you this uh it's it's some of the very largest equipment factory in the world um, folks who have more engineers than we have employees um uh that say you guys have something special and we'd like to capitalize on that. And they partnered up with us on it to do just that. Uh, so, um, but yeah, it, it was, it was very expensive to get to the point and very time consuming, but certainly uh, well worth, you know, uh, ultimately our goal is to have uh, what, what we refer to as no boots on a barge, which means you don't have to put anybody out there, uh, uh, because we know, we all know that that's the most dangerous part of, uh, of anybody's job when, when it comes to the river, you, you're quite uh, well aware of that as well. Anytime you, somebody crossing over a threshold going from, you know, either shore side to a barge or a tug or from a tug to a barge or vice versa is very, very dangerous. So anytime we can eliminate that potential, uh, then that's a win for our, for our employees and our company. Of course, there are vast safety benefits in that regard, but uh, how did that affect your your personnel, your staffing level, staffing requirements out there on the river? So it, it, it affects it in, in a very positive way. Now, I, like I mentioned earlier, what you you can save on the potential of you know material handler operators, uh, out there because you can have one person that runs multiple machines, but ultimately you, you replace those people with a different skill set, right? So we now need guys who understand, uh, radio comms better. We need guys who can, you know, on the technological end. So it, 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 it can reduce the overall number of folks, but it, re it, it replaces them with, maybe a lesser number of folks, but at a different skill set uh, as well. So um, I, I don't know, I don't know what that final number will be. Um, but I, I do know, uh, you know, it will be a, a net probably reduction in workforce. Um, not by a lot, but by some, right. Um, and but like I said, you, 
you trade, uh, you know, some of those folks out for for a, a different, uh, often higher paying skill set. Well, as I know very little about it, um, walk me through the process, I guess, um, of delivering on a commitment to a customer from from meeting them, shaking their hand for the first time, finding out what they need. I, I don't know how you price out Steve Adoring services and then all the way from meeting a new customer to unloading that their their vessel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so Tim, what what happens is, you know, like like anybody else, you know, you you go out and you the first thing is to, <clears throat> to try to um, you know, recognize who the customers are from from our perspective that's not a very difficult thing to do right and of course most people would be would say right now like well, what are you talking about well the truth is there's only a finite number of folks that are going to move uh dry bulk commodities or what have you from you know in and out of the country right whether it's grains or salts or minerals and ores or any of that sort of stuff certainly there's you know a lot of commodities but a very finite number of those right it's not like uh, and i always get a kick out of these these folks that do these mass marketing campaigns and they're like they see my name on linkedin they say oh i see you're in sales would you like you know lead generation i, I can give you the top 500 folks in your you know your your lexicon there that you and i'm and I'm like, mm, no, you didn't do your research, you know, and uh, or it's even funnier to, we'll, you know, sometimes you'll get folks who are even more clueless that are trying to sell us things. And they'll, you get to call like, uh, can I speak to Mr. Steve Doring? And uh, so at that point, I, you know, I say, uh, please hold. And I, I switch him over to my brother's phone. But um, <laughs> no, but in but uh, in, in reality, there's, you know, you can it's, it's very easy to do the research to see who. Uh, is moving on the river, right? And then you, you 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 take a look at what they're doing, and then you have to ask, like, and, and are we the group that can help them the best, right? And and so and once you determine that we can we can be either the best or equally as good as the other guys, uh, what makes sense for the customer? Again, uh, my my number one goal here is not certainly as an employee to associated terminals is to do well for them, but also as an advocate for the river, right? Because we, we want the commodities to come here. We're in a constant battle, you know, against, um, uh, you know, East Coast, West Coast, Houston, Mobile, uh, that sort of stuff. And, um, and we know over time, uh, you know, that, uh, that, New Orleans represents the best value in a lot of ways, although there's there's some strong competition coming on in Houston and and less or so in Mobile, but still some nonetheless, you know. Uh, and so once you identify those those customers, then uh, and, and and oftentimes you know you can just you know go to the different industry uh, conferences uh, or um, or just by word of mouth and, you know, just taking a look out your window and seeing what's moving on the river, what vessels are moving out there, you know? So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, and then, you know, you, you meet with these folks and a lot of these folks, you know, right off the bat, uh, will either say, Hey, I've already got somebody or on the other hand, they say, look, I'm willing to talk. And, um, uh, and for me, uh, again, my, my whole way of, um, uh, approaching um, potential customers o over the years uh, is, is, is never to say, you know, like how awful the next guy is or this or that. I just sort of tell them what I can do and, um, you know, uh, and, and, and that I'd like to help them and, and, and really just give me a shot at what you got going on. And, um, you know, uh, you know, I mean, You'd say, well, you know, well, okay, pricing is is a big thing, and and to to some folks it is. I'm not, don't get me wrong, money is what runs the world, as as we all know. But when you, I think, when you're dealing with the amount of 
of a, a commodity that, that these folks are and the amount of money that's being dealt there. You know, if you're, you know, if you're up by a nickel or 10 cents, that's not really going to swing somebody's, you know, and I mean, and, and nobody's usually too far out of the ballpark, you know, and, and if folks are making judgment based on a, you know, a nickel or a dime, then you realize you, you may not be dealing with the the right customers sometimes you know and, and they get in transition and that that happens sometimes somebody the new guy will come in or new girl or whoever you know, will come in and want to make a difference and thinking that you know they're they're saving a nickel on a a ton and then you know and the next thing you know it's they they they've ended up spending two dollars somewhere else that they didn't know was going to happen or they didn't pay close enough attention or take the advice that you gave them uh and so um so you know from a from a pricing perspective um you know we of course like everybody else you 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 run these financial models and you you realize that um we we realize for sure that uh we've been uh as an industry in in the stevedoring end of things very undisciplined if you will um over the last 20 plus years in the way that we price the goods, uh, handling of the goods here and cargoes here in, in the river. Uh, and it was, it's, it's never been more exemplified than uh, we, we were doing a, a grand opening. This is, and this was several years back prior to uh, my being with associated. I was at St. James at the time. And we were, we had a, a customer that we uh, had built a warehouse for here uh, just north of convent and um, at the grand opening we uh, we were talking to these guys it turns out they happen to be our very first customer or St. James Stevedoring's very first customer um, and back when it started in 85 or 83 or I forget exactly which one it was and uh, they realized that and this was 25 years later that the rate had only gone up by 15 cents. Right. And so that's where, where have you ever heard that anywhere else, you know? And, uh, and so we, we, we started to realize what we asked ourselves. So how could, how can we even be making money? And, it, and it's really just by the technology that we've brought in, you know, cause we can do it, you know, faster, more efficient, you know, and safer. And so all these things added up to where we were, we're able to, you know, sort of stay alive, but we have, you know, in competition with all the other folks uh, that, that do this. I mean, there's not a whole bunch of us, but there's enough competition there that, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, they, they certainly keep you honest, but I'll start to realize that, um, you know, we were all, you know, just sort of, um, going as low as we could to get get the tons and, and and what you realize is that that oftentimes is a loser for you uh because you don't want to be the loss leader you know but somewhere within that very small margin you are that person right and then you have you know instances where like over the last couple of years and, and they have been real eye openers for us in that you know you have uh you know who could you know forecast a world pandemic coming along and for the dynamics of uh, business to change uh, like they like they did or you know who could foresee uh, you know the the interest rates skyrocketing you know we have interest rates like we haven't seen in a generation you know uh, who could who could have foreseen the the, the fuel rates skyrocketing like they did uh, and 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 so and then needless to say the labor you know it's it's hard to find good folks and it's it's increasingly expensive and so when you have all these things that hit at once you realize that you didn't have you didn't have those sorts of margins in your uh in your rates before and so uh those things all coalesced and and, and I, I can't speak for any other groups although talking to someone kind of i kind of have heard the same thing we, we all got a kick in the teeth over the last, you know, year and a half, two years. And so, um, so, you know, customers are starting to see that, uh, you know, a bump up in rates, 
uh, for, so so that we can all uh, survive. And so, but it's it's a very difficult task and a fine line uh, to walk. So, you know, so at this point, we've you know you you've identified the folks that are customers. You've uh, you, you set out rates that are, you know, somewhere in the pack close to as long as you're not outrageously out of line uh, with folks. I think from then and, and then and probably the most important uh, of those things is it's your service. Right. I mean, at the root of it all. Yes, we say we're a technology company and, you know, but it's your service. Right. Um, these things all those things all help with our, our ability to serve our customers, but it's it's about doing the right thing for your customer. And at the and also it's about, you know, and I'll go back to also, you know, when we identify the customers and go talk to those customers, it's about having the right story to tell them. And I've been fortunate enough to work for these groups that always give me the right story to tell our customer. And by the right story, I mean the, 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 the honest one, the one that says, this is what we can do. This is how we're going to do it. This is when we're going to do it. And, and then commit to that and do it. And if we don't get it right, then we, we make up for that, you know? Uh, and, and, and so when, when your group gives you the ability to, to always have that right story to tell and for you to make things right when, when, uh, you didn't uh, get it right in the first place. No one can ever fault you. We we all know, you know, in this this industry, in any industry, if you are, uh, you're never going to get it right every time, right? But it's how you handle when things go awry that customers remember you the most for. And so, uh, the le- uh, and again, I'll go back to say the leeway that our the groups that I've worked for have given me to correct those things is carte blanche, pretty much, you know, uh, they said, Hey, fix it, you know, whatever it takes. And sometimes that means we take a loss on the deal, you know, but that also means I'll, I'll get the next vessel and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll do better. And we'll, we'll, we'll start to build that uh, trust back and make, uh, you know, start to make some, some money again with it. Uh, and so, and, you know, and, and additionally, we in order to give that great service, though, I mean, you've got the right story, right? And you and you've got the, the leeway to do what you need to do in case there's uh, it doesn't turn out exactly how we wanted it to. We then have to make our workforce smart enough to understand what all of our goals are, right? So, and for us, you know, we you know have reached out to our our guys out in the field. And we want those guys to think like owners, right? We want them to know that the decisions that they make, how they affect the company, how they affect the, you know, us, how they affect the guy standing next to them, how it affects them, you know? Uh, and, and of course, the easy way we all say to do that as well, you know, you give them, you give them bonuses, you know, uh, based on performance. And yeah, absolutely, certainly. But as you know, oftentimes money is not everything it's it's about quality of life and so and then so when you make these folks you know when you help them understand what it is that everybody's after at the root of it all most folks want to do a good job you have to put the right folks in their line of command that say you know we appreciate that right job and train them to be better and then give them a path forward you know, and we have a, you know, here at at, uh, at this group, you know, associated, uh, I don't want to turn this into associated commercial, but I mean, part of it is, you know, we give them a path forward, you know, and people wonder why this facility is what it is and why it's become the largest Steve on the river. It's, it's primarily because of those people, you know, and those people being our people, you know, uh, out there and that uh, we've, we've given them the tools to, to do what they need to do well, right? We give them the best best equipment on the river. But more importantly, we take time to, to teach them uh, how to better, not only our company, because we all, you know, the more we get paid overall, the better, but how to, how to, how to better themselves as, as people, 
not only in their work life, but in their off life. You know, we encourage them to, to take time off, their time off and, you know, their vacation. And, you know, we, we were, you know, we give them schedules so that they can, you know, back in the day, uh, folks who were stevedores, you know, you basically were chasing ships. Like they'd just call up the group and say, hey, we got a ship tomorrow. Come on in. Or you never knew when you were off or not. And we we turned that, that, that dynamic on his head and said, you now have a, a ship, whether we have vessels or not. You know, uh, this is when you're working. This is when you're off. And so people could, could, could plan better their personal lives. They could plan to be at, at their at their daughter's soccer game or, or whatever. And and folks that can do that make better workers when they're here. You know, uh, and so um, that that really is the, the, the crux of everything uh, in, in, in any in, in any job that uh, people enjoy doing. They, they, they want to feel worthwhile. They want to be compensated for it. They want to understand what's going on, you know. Uh, and and if you do all those things correctly, then you have everybody pulling in the same direction, you know. Uh, and 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 you you pretty much can't help but be successful. So, um, uh, and so it, it really boils down to you know having uh, you know our folks think like that 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 um, that really allow us to pull off these jobs. Right. And then, you know, once you have that and then you pull off these successful movements and then, you know, you, and you go back to the customer and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and you just, you know, you, you work out, um, you, you try to be as proactive as you can with them uh, as well so that they can be uh, as forthcoming to you with their information so that you can plan better to work them better. And it's just, you know, you, you develop this, this relationship with them, like you do your workers to try to clue them into what it is you're doing and how you're doing it. And, and, and again, you know, for them to realize that, you know, this isn't, I'm not just here just trying to like take every bit of money from you that I possibly can. I'm here to do a service for you so we can both have a long-term run at this thing. And, 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 and again, once they see the, 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 the whole picture and you've presented it to them now through the, they've had the movements and they've seen that you do what you say and say what you do. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it becomes, you know, it comes, um, it starts to work like a well-oiled machine and then it becomes relatively easy. You know, um, uh, you no longer are feeling like, from, from a sales perspective that you, you know, you, you have to win these people over uh, to get them to, to move with you. You, um, you know, you then have formed um, a bond uh, and even oftentimes, very oftentimes, uh, more often than not, a friendship with these folks, you know? And so, uh, and again, but you only get friendships with folks by, you know, again, by having that, 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 that honesty and that right story to tell and, and treat them fairly when it's, you know, in, in every aspect. Well, are your services priced per ton? Is that how it's sold or per bite? It, it, it's, it's per ton, um, you know, and um, it, the, the, there's variances across the board in, in the different things. And, and in, in general, as a rule of thumb, Tim, what you what you do is you um, if something is uh, heavier, then that means it moves faster, right? And so that's that's one thing that goes into it. The the slower it moves, then the, the longer it takes. Uh, so that's one thing that factors into how you price that. Uh, whether or not it's a weather sensitive commodity is yet another thing that you have to factor in there. If it's weather sensitive, then you have uh, you know, uh, covered barges that you're utilizing. And so then you have cover handling. And of course, here in South Louisiana, rain can happen at any time. Uh, one quick little antidote I'll give you there. Uh, I had some time back had done a, a rain study for a, a coal company that was moving uh, coal via midstream here on the river. And, um, uh, because they were trying to keep their the, the moisture in their in their barges in check, and and of course 
down here, that's not very easy to do. But as part of the rain study, uh, I, 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 I determined, you know, what our annual rainfall here is. But an interesting fact is, if I were to ask you, what are the three rainiest cities in America? Most folks would probably say Seattle, Portland, you know, something, uh, you know, those, those sorts. Turns out it's Houston, New Orleans, and Tampa, you know, uh, which was eye-opening to me and to some degree, right? Uh, and it's and it's not because, you know, those places, the, the Seattles and the Portlands of the world have more rainy days, but when we get rain down here, it can come in, in, uh, in buckets, you know? And so that was kind of the thing. I thought that was pretty interesting, but, uh, so, uh, obviously, you know, if you have material that's, that's, that's weather sensitive and you got to handle covers that slows you down and, uh, and, and, and elongates the, the process as well. So, you know, materials that are weather sensitive, you know, have yet another, uh, level of cost to them as well. Um, uh, we, uh, we tend to stay away from, uh, uh, hazardous materials. So, but there are a couple that, that we, that we may handle those, those, those require a premium. Um, and again, because, you know, those uh, require people wear different, uh, apparatuses and have to work or be exposed to it or not for different amounts of time. And you need more people. Uh, but again, we, we generally try to stay away from those, but uh, you know, when it does happen, that's, that's a little, that's a, that, that, that one has an added cost. Uh, if you have a material that's, uh, particularly dusty, you know, uh, again, that, that requires, a, a, you know, a little more money again, because you're having to, you know, even though it's not raining outside, if the wind's blowing, you got to close, close down. So, so there are different levels to how you price these things out uh, or different reasons, I, sh I should say, for different levels on how you price these, these, these things out. But uh, invariably, it's, it's, it's by ton when you're talking about bulk commodities. When you're talking about project cargoes, things like wind turbines or something of that nature, then that's, that's a per piece type deal. Um, uh, you know, um, any of those big pressure vessels, that's, that's all a very specialized stuff, but in general, bulk cargoes are priced out by, by the ton. Well, finally, I know you said you've watched a few episodes of this little show. What do you think about this project I have going on? Uh, to be quite honest, Tim, I, I really enjoy it. And, uh, I'm honestly honored to be a part of it because I've seen some of the, the, the folks that you've had on, on here and a lot of folks that I respect very much. And, uh, I've, I've enjoyed listening to it and, uh, I, I keep it oftentimes playing while I'm sitting here doing some work, I'll be listening to some and, and sometimes I'll find myself actually watching it as well, you know, um, but I, I've really enjoyed it. I think it's a good thing. I, I, I appreciate the fact that you're doing it. Uh, I'm honored that you asked me to do it. Uh, hopefully I did it justice. I, I tend to, to ramble a lot. So I'm, I don't know if you really got out of it what you uh, had hoped uh, or how it's going to come off. But I, I hope, uh, like I said, based on the, the amount of respect that I have for the program that you're doing, that I've done it some justice myself. I do. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Tim. Good talking to you. Talk to you soon. I say I'm trying to get this money, so I gotta stay gone. I tell my mama that I love her, even though I do wrong. And I've been praying to the Lord, I just gotta stay strong.